Hey everybody, welcome back. I'm Emily Moyer from Off Planet Media and uh, I have guests with me and this will be the continuation of the Alchemical Insiders series with Chris and Steve Crimmy. And we're gonna try <laughs> to pick up <laughs> where we left off, at least in the first hour. The first hour will be sort of the Alchemical Insiders segment and then in the second hour, we may just have a general chat about the um, spectacular shit show. Uh, just <laughs> but, you know, before um, the virus, we did a show that was uh, the, you know, the next in the series of sort of the sacred geometry shows, and it was the sacred geometry of Astana, Kazakhstan. And we had initially intended for the first segment to be that, and the second segment to be the sort of light spectrum of Astana, because it is astonishing. Mm -hmm. um, but we went really long. We had a really interesting show. Randy was with us that night. Mm -hmm. Steve broke out his The City as the Chakra System Theory, and we got into all sorts of stuff, but we never got to the sort of discussion about the light spectrum that is represented there, the, the sort of vast color, the very colorful sort of background or foreground that is presented there and what its purpose and what all of the functions of it may be. And so we decided we were going to make, you know, make a separate part two. And then we got hit with the virus and that kind of overtook everything and sent us all on sort of a different trajectory in terms of what we were paying attention to as far as what we were consuming, but also the kind of information we were putting out. And so I thought, well, we should probably revisit this because we told people that we would. Um, and when I went back, so was Chris and Steve and I have been talking about this for a little bit in the background. Um, and when I went and looked at all the sort of articles and notes I had pulled, I'm like, well, this stuff's all very interesting, but I can't quite remember where it was I was going with this. And it made me think about uh, what I've been talking about with a few people lately that was a topic of conspiracy cocktail last time. And, and I've had a few comments on it on the show, and that is that we are in narrative warfare. And when your attention is taken away from whatever narrative you're working on or whatever line of information you're following, and it gets sucked into something else, then you sort of lose your thread of things. And, you know, I'm wondering, like, oh, I wonder how many times in my life that may have happened that, like, I was on to something that was either really interesting or meaningful, maybe not a huge thing on the scope of, like, the collective for the collective on earth, but for myself and a personal breakthrough, but maybe something important, how many times that's happened to people, right? Where they were really onto something and their attention got pulled away. And when they went back to it, it just, things didn't quite line up in the same way. Mm -hmm. So I felt like this was an important enough topic and we had promised a second part. And I think it's interesting and playful that we should revisit it. I don't know if it will end up being the same show that it would have been. It's gonna be a lot looser, no yeah. less structured. Um, but I wanted to do it. So for the uh, light spectrum part of our Astana Al Alchemical Insider Series, Chris and Steve, welcome back. Thanks. Thanks, Emily. Thanks, Emily. And yeah, I would, I would say it reminds me of one time when um, our guru said to me, uh, it was a certain situation that I had missed an occasion and I brought something to her house to make up for it. And she said, oh, no, 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 no. The moment has passed. Mm -hmm. So... I think it's one of those situations where that moment passed, but then a whole new constellation of events came in in its place and everything's changed. Yep. Right. And as far as guests, I like to think that we're playmates. <laughs> we're play yeah, we are. <laughs> we, have <a> giant, <laughs> we have a giant playpen that spans from Asheville to Los Angeles. There you go. And we're just playing. Yeah, I, I do like, like that. that. I like that we're playmates. I love it. I love our friendship. I love our ex informational exchanges. You know, we obviously do some shows together, but we also chat a lot in the background. And it's really fun to sort of run my thoughts and ideas by you guys because you guys have a completely different set of life experiences than I do. You know what I mean? And and uh, perspective that um, you guys are really playful and fun. So I don't want to say it's more mature, but I've been accused in my life of being immature and all of that sort of mature influences in my life think I'm batshit, like, you know, my parents and my family and whatever. So it's kind of nice to get a different perspective from people who've been around a little longer, from people who either don't think I'm batshit or only like me because I am batshit. <laughs> I, think, I think that's it, Emily. I think that's why. You know, well, you know, as, as, we, as we probably talked about before, Chris is 31 years in a, in a psych center and you know, I worked there for two years. And so we, we know awesome. real bad shit. <laughs> 
We know, like, literally swinging from the rafters, literally, yeah. that shit. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. You guys ever watch the show Legion? Mm -mm. Mm -mm. Check no. it out. Like, I, I started watching it a couple years ago and then got distracted. <laughs> and we just are revisiting it recently. And it's kind of like that space where Psych Ward and MKUltra, like, overlap. Oh, right really? it's super interesting yeah. and because you guys have experience inside of the psych ward i would love mm -hmm. to know if like there's any resemblance of that or if this is really just these kids were really just mk kids that were being convinced mm -hmm. that they were crazy or whatever i want to know what you're because sometimes you like see the crazy people on the corner and like you're like dude that fool is crazy but when you get close enough you're like shit he says all the same shit i say dude right <laughs> <laughs> well. Yeah. Well, I, I was saying, I think, I think One Flew Over the Cuckoo's Nest is probably the closest depiction. And after, I remember, you know, reading it and then, you know, seeing it beforehand. And then after working there, I couldn't watch it again. Yeah. Hmm. Um, but that's probably but as close a depiction as to what it's like to be there. I, on the other hand, took my patients to see it in the theater when it came out. So <laughs> that is two different takes on that film. Yeah. So you took your patients to see it. Now, did your patients think that was crazy or did it look normal to them? I don't, I, you know, I don't know what, I probably would not do that again today. Huh. You know, given the opportunity, it was a geriatric, it was a geriatric group, geriatric it was board. old burnt out schizophrenics, you know, in the geriatric unit. And mm -hmm. I used to take them on field trips and I took them to see one flew over the cuckoo's nest. Yeah. I don't remember them having a reaction. You know, they just plot along and you know they don't <laughs> Did yeah, you, the poor things they've been kind of flattened out by life you know you other worked, than their since you guys worked in we're already getting off track but that's okay it goes where it goes um since you guys worked in a psych unit and you worked with schizophrenics and stuff like were any of the doctors in the, where you were working using like high dose vitamin b3 and vitamin c therapy no, at all no no. no just shots for um for serious alcoholics they would every once in a while give them vitamin B shots. That probably be twelve though, right? They were probably giving right. them. Yeah. Right, mm -hmm. right. But but there was no. No. There was none of that, and you know it was really vitamin therapy for, therapy for schizophrenic was kind of new. Although I did have a patient who would go into um, into New York, and he would buy his own medicinal herbs uh -huh. to try to treat himself, and he was always making you know concoctions and but you know of, of health food kind of things and herbs like medicinal herbs you'd go to the chinese market and, and so buy. no so no integration at all of orthomolecular nutrition or psychiatry no no, no. The, the, the psychiatrist basically as as one psychiatrist called the rest of the psychiatrists that they're all awards yeah <laughs> yeah you know that they were they were there almost all of them were not american uh-huh Right. Um, they were all from, they were all from, uh, mostly from Latin American countries. One was Argentinian, one was Peruvian, Venezuelan. one was Venezuelan, one was Hungarian. Interesting. Um, and, interesting. yeah, and they were just there to, you know, cash One was them. Turkish. Yeah, one, they're, they're basically, they're getting a nice state pay, paycheck and doing, I'm for doing next, not To be not fair, a lot. to be fair, I really believe that most of the, the employees there Mm -hmm. were very kind and compassionate i would say it, uh, unlike what you would think that the typical perception of a state-run facility would be mm -hmm. uh oftentimes the family members would say that that they were grateful because they got better care there than they did in a private hospital oh interesting well i mean yeah. you, you guys were there so obviously there was there well, was some uh some yeah. good stuff going on are you got you guys are familiar with orthomolecular psychiatry sure. aren't you? Mm -hmm. yeah, okay mm -hmm. yeah yeah yeah, yeah. but there was a lot of compassion i'm happy to say mm -hmm. true compassion yeah and kindness which well, was really very good very uh -huh. and of course you know given you know, if you took a slice of society, there would always be some people who were not kind yeah. and took advantage. But I would say overwhelmingly, the oh. people were good that I came across. Really good. All right. And on that note of kindness and compassion, let's move on to the former Soviet Union. All right. You know, the Soviet Union, yeah. So the interesting about that in psychiatry, of course, is that um, under Stalin, anyone... 
um, the, the way they worked it out, they're, they're catch-22. If you didn't agree with socialism, mm -hmm. you were considered insane because, how, because socialism was the perfect form of government, the perfect political system. So ergo, if you did not believe in it or if you had a problem with it, you were insane. And that's where all the intellectuals left were mostly, you know, you read, read uh, Alexander Solzhenitsyn, you know, mm -hmm. to get details on this. But they were all put in mental hospitals. They were basically yeah. prisons and kept, you know, under heavy, heavy sedation. Mm -hmm. So, so um, yeah, so that's, so yeah, talk about a country that's been traumatized. Well, it's so interesting because you hear like the stuff like that, the horror stories like that, but then you also hear really interesting things about their understanding, understanding of certain kinds of therapeutic technologies, like living in like a more TP or pyramid kind of structure. They put their prisoners mm -hmm. in those kinds of structures and the recidivism rate is less and the improvement mm -hmm. rate is higher. So it's so interesting. It put, I mean, in some ways, the, the same, obviously the same thing could be said for here, right? Like on a certain level, we have such a good grip on like certain possibilities and in another way, it's like, yeah, we're just still in the stone ages. You know what I mean? It's just, it's so. Well, it's the pitfall of the broad brush approach. You know, you can't just paint everyone with the same brush. Yeah. It's just really unfair. And, yeah. and a lot of the good stuff has been coming out, you know, since the fall of, of the Soviet <laughs> Union and, you know, under, under Russia. And a lot of the scientists seem to have gotten a little better off and be able to conduct interesting research. And apparently they're like, I used to um, edit this sort of fringy, uh, uh, this journal just as the internet was kind of hitting called Electric Spacecraft Journal. And it was run oh. by this guy, Charles Yost. And he, um, he was uh, actually worked on the lunar landing module um, as a NASA scientist. And he developed a form of memory foam mm -hmm. early on that they use in the seats and airplane cockpits and things like that. And somehow he's able to get out of there with, with the patent. And so he started a factory up near here and he built a pyramid into his house and he was just an out there interesting well, guy. I have a question. Was his memory foam, which is foam that they stored the astronauts' memory in so that they would think Yeah, that's it. <laughs> that's it. <laughs> and really it was just under their head. Injected through the ear. I think so. <laughs> <laughs> I believe too much. What was a brain is now foam. <laughs> So, I'm sure that's it, Emily. <laughs> so anyway, so I forgot why I was talking about electric spacecraft. But anyway, there was kind of a, anyway, at that time, the, all the, all he had these sort of, you know, loose, you know, un-university or corporate affiliated scientist friends. And they had a little, they had a little house where they would gather and do their little yeah, uh, electrogravitic right. experiments. And um, they, at the time, they were saying, yeah, I mean, the Soviets were way ahead of anything that we were doing. Mm -hmm. And um, Charles was interesting, even though he even though he worked on the lunar lander landing module, he was um, open to the possibility that there was no lunar landing, at least on the first one. <laughs> that it was, you know. So you know, he was an interesting guy. He yeah. was, and and yeah, and he had a really nice uh, edition of Manly P. Hall's. What was the, what's the book? The uh, Secret Teaching of Secret all Teachings of All Ages. Somehow we ended up with it. Yeah. Anyway, <laughs> anyway, so that was Charles Yost and his daughter does the, is an incredible designer. She book uh, designs all our books, and she does an incredible She's very job. Talented. Susan Yost. Anyway, give a nod out to her. Right. Anyway, so um, but but I really enjoyed visiting uh, his house because yeah. literally the roof, the upstairs, the upper portion, was sort of a columnar maybe square columnar, but it was a pyramid. He had a pyramid. He built, actually built the pyramid into his house. So he lived under a pyramid. Wow, yeah, well, this electric spacecrafts and living under pyramids kind of transfers us over into our topic for the day here, which is sort of the otherworldly, or in some cases, almost alien looking landscape that we're being presented with in some of these former Soviet mm -hmm. or, or Eastern Bloc kinds of, you know, kinds of countries. Mm -hmm. um, and, you know, I think we'll start with some of the stuff with Astana, but we may extend out into some of the surrounding areas and things as we talk about this. And the reason I was interested in this topic, basically, like, it goes back to when I first found out about Astana, right? I've known about Kazakhstan since I was a kid because a lot of the Soviet gymnasts were from there. And whatnot. Mm -hmm. But my attention was first drawn to Astana by Seven Bomar. And um, he just was like, oh, dude, you got to look at these pictures of Astana, man. You got to see what's going on there. And, you know, like this oh, is. Oh, really? So you, you were aware probably, of it? 
back in 2012, 2013, maybe a little bit later than that. Mm -hmm. And um, so I, I, I pulled up the pictures and I was like, oh, wow. And at that time I was still fucked in the head and not able, you know, I could look at stuff and be like, I couldn't um, put together sort of a, a comprehensive series of thoughts on something and express them. Like it was gyrating around wildly in my mind what this all could be, but I couldn't um, express it in a way that was meaningful and therefore also it wasn't as meaningful to me as I've learned how to express these things better I've also developed a better understanding of them mm -hmm. but I looked at it and I was like dude this shit looks psychedelic man like this is what it looks like when I'm on psychedelics right like the tones the colors mm -hmm. the shapes you know and um, from that and this is, might all just be completely made up in my head um, but from the first time I heard him talk about it I'm like this is both a real and a not real place. It is accessible and inaccessible, mm -hmm. right? And, um, you know, it seems to me like maybe some, I don't know, like what the sort of frequency is there, the resonance. It feels to me like the kind of place that exists in a liminal space between worlds, right? Like it's sort of, mm. you know, there may be an aspect to it that is overlaid on, what, what, what was like the, what we talked about before, like these awful camps, you know, outside of the Soviet Union or where all of this kinds of certain aspects of almost slavery and things like that took place. But there seems to be something psychedelic, futuristic, technological that's been overlaid on top of that. So and, the Disneyland -ish. Yeah, well, they yeah. even call it Futuristan sometimes. Futuristan. And mm -hmm. I don't, I, I haven't met anyone that's been there. I know you guys have. Um, but I haven't. No, we haven't. No, no. Oh, you haven't. Okay. Oh, no. Okay. So the lady that you guys knew at didn't hadn't actually been there. No. No. Gotcha. Okay. So I've not met anybody that's been there. And when I look at the pictures, there's rarely very many people mm -hmm. in the pictures, right? Like maybe a few here and there. Um, and I don't. The pictures always seem to be like. It looks like it's always perpetually spring or summer. Like I don't see any mm. pictures where there seems to be harsh weather or snow, which mm. I think from its location, it might be a place that was cold a good portion of the year. Yes. Yeah, it's don't probably see like that. Tibet where there's just, you know, where I mean, to, you know, it's very dry and you'll, it'll, it could be unbelievably cold and there'll just be like a dusting of snow. Right, but I ground. thought, wasn't there marshland there? This... So... Yeah, but that would be in the summer. Uh-huh. But yes, so 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 yes, it is. I think there's there's not. It's either like because of the brutal climate, there's not a lot of good reason for people to be outside unless they're tourists checking out stuff. Right. When I read the book on it, I um, I remember them saying that it was mosquito ridden in the summer, and just windswept frigid in the winter. Oh, interesting. So extremes, and but they've done a lot of planting of trees as barrier for the wind and I'm sure that's made some difference that can help tremendously well so for me it's like I'm starting to think is like are what we're looking at here is like maybe the first really like maybe not the first but the first full like full-on really completely done up smart city right that includes things on a certain level like season and temperature control Mm -hmm. Right. Like one of the things I think about when I look at it is like, <clears throat> have you guys ever been to Caesar's Palace in Las Vegas? Never been to Vegas. Or have you ever been to the Riverwalk in San Antonio? Nope. All right. So when you're in Caesar's Palace, there's like a section where there's like a, it's like a shopping mall and there's a lot of restaurants. It's not where the casino is. And it's inside, but the ceiling is painted so that it looks like there's sky above. And at different times, they do different things with the lights. And sometimes it has that feeling of being outside. It's like outside, inside. Like you, it can be confusing mm -hmm. for the senses. But it's inside. And at the Riverwalk in San Antonio, it's outside. But the way that, like, the, there's businesses and stuff on both sides of the, you know, kind of the river. They've made, like, a promenade of different stuff. And the way it is, sometimes it feels like you're inside, even though you're outside, Right. And it can become a little confusing to the senses. So one is inside, but it feels like outside. And the other is outside, but it feels like it could be inside. And it just feels like what I would describe as a very controlled environment, like a terrarium of sort, right? Yeah, yeah. And so when I look at Astana, I see um, 
something that seems kind of like that, like a, like an, almost like a, you know, like enclosed, you know, sort of like, even though it's possible, we're all living under a dome. But you know how when you see like depictions of what the, the place, like the world might be like in the future, like the cities, they show them sort of like these domed yes. metropolises. Mm -hmm. like yes, yes. Feels like that, we're just not seeing those outer edges, right? Like when you look at the pictures of Astana, like most of them seem to be, I think, I think everything we're looking at is within the same few miles of the area that is kind of central. Mm -hmm. And so like it has that sort of Epcot Center, Disney World sort of feel to it, but with a much more metaphysical bent to it than Disneyland does, right? Like a much, much more, and that metaphysical bent came through when we were doing the last show with Randy and especially towards the end when Steve was breaking out how he thought that this was, um, you know, possibly a, a grid for the chakra system. We know that, like, you look at people's work like Robert Homrick and a few, there's many others, but you can see that, like, a lot of Washington, D.C. and many of the other cities, they're, like, in a sort of geometric form, or they look like an owl, or they look like some different kind of thing. But this- and Some of the cathedrals, too. Yeah, this may be the first city that really was, ex expressly like it, 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 explicitly designed right with the sort of idea um of the chakra system and in my head it feels to me like um okay so they have all this stuff they have all this futuristic looking stuff the colors and the tones are very um psychedelic looking they're very pretty there is a certain even though i was like whoa what the fuck is this when i saw it there was something pleasing about it to me. Yes. There's something that brings like an internal feeling of like harmony when you mm -hmm. see some of those tones, right? Some of those really vivid pinks and greens and blues and whatever. It's kind of like what the light spectrum used to look like before it got so dense here on earth and we have some mm -hmm. genetic memory of it or something, right? Mm -hmm. And it's almost like, I feel like, so I'm reading this book called Right Use of Will, right? And it's, an interesting book about how the human spirit and will got separated from each other, mm -hmm. right? And there's this Is it Steinerian or who, who wrote it? There's no author. It's a channel, it's, chan it's received by somebody named Sian de Rohan. Um, it's, it's, it was written in 1984, um, but it's quite an interesting book. There's a lot of stuff in there that I would classify as nonsense and a lot of stuff I would classify in there as like, damn, that is exactly right. You know what I mean? So that's kind of like everything meaningful these days. Just you got to use your discernment to, you know, kind of like chew everything and spit out the seeds or whatever, you know, I don't know. But there's this part in here that describes something that happened on earth. And they were at that back before all this happened, they were calling earth pan. Right. And it says, I just want to read this one paragraph. It says pan changed after the, so there had been uh, a dark spirit that came to earth and they call him the denial wizard. Right, and he got into a, a battle of magic with a light wizard who was trying to sort of protect Earth as it had been. And um, it says, and, and the dark wizard won, okay? The dark, the, they called him the denial wizard. Mm -hmm. Pan changed after this duel of magic. It was still very beautiful by any of today's standards, but it now had a more dense form of light. All the changes took longer and they all took more effort. So like they, these people used to be able to change things at will with their mind and things like that. So it could still happen, but it took more effort. And instead of calling a reality to them, spirits now found it easier to go to that reality. Certain settings began to settle into certain places on earth and spirits that were having trouble agreeing on their surroundings solved it by leaving the surroundings in one place and going back there when they wanted to. So it makes me think about like those of us who are just over it with this fucking bullshit on earth, right? Like a lot of us who have, you know, maybe I don't want to say it in a more spiritual bent, but sort of something inside of us remembers a different time or sees off in the future a different possibility, right? Like we are frustrated sometimes and um, we like to think about, oh, I just want to leave this behind and go exist with pe like, in a community with the people who are like me or, you know, go to some place. You know, a lot of us end up, you know, going to like getting involved in things like the rave scene or the Burning Man or whatever. And there is this psychedelic, futuristic 
sort of idealistic place that we all sort of imagine in our heads. And I would imagine that you guys, based on a lot of the things you've told me you're interested in over the years, have as well, right? And these things that seem like a place we can only visit in magical moments or in our psychedelic states or whatever, used to sort of be our general state of being. We would like imagine something and we'd create it, right? And somewhere that connection has been severed. And so instead of pulling the reality we want towards us, we're willing to travel to a place that seems like, like uh, something that is more like a, you know, panacea, right? Or like a Garden of Eden. You mean and like a physical place? A physical place, right? Mm -hmm. Because, because it's, we're looking for something that we remember in our mind. Mm -hmm. right from a previous lifetime or a future lifetime because time isn't what we think it is or a parallel lifetime you know i don't know i know you guys have had a few little psychedelic experiences not necessarily of the light colorful playful kind um but you know one of the things that people especially who've had like mushroom kind of psychedelic experiences although i've heard some people say this on dmt is like Oh my, I love it there. Like that feels like home. That, that's amazing. You know, like that's the kind of, I mean, for me, whenever I have a psychedelic trip, the thoughts, the information is fascinating, but the part to me that is always with me that I want to see again are those colors, right? Like the colors are just different than what we have here, right? Mm -hmm. There is an emotion and an intelligence and a set of information attached to them mm -hmm. that like we're missing out on because something has been dulled here. Have you guys mm -hmm. had any of these experiences? This, well, in dreams, I have. Yeah, well, I can. Um, I know there's a million places to go. I'm going to start. I'm going to start because most of our um, dissatisfactions and grieving is is from a feeling of a loss of something from the past, right? A connection, a, a higher spiritual age, and and things like that. Um, so a lot of what you just described, and I think I, uh, I mentioned it once to you before, it comes is, is from in Socrates, in uh, one of the Plato's dialogues, in uh, the, the, the Phaedrus, I think it is. Anyway, so it's, it's the Socrates on his deathbed, and the last thing he does before he takes his hemlock is, um, so he's having a, you know, a, a discussion with one of his students, and he says, well, well, I, this is what I think, or I know, or a likely story of what happens uh, mm -hmm. when, you, when, you, when you go, but he starts talking about the true earth, mm -hmm. real earth. And he says, we are inside the earth. Mm -hmm. So you're talking about, like you were talking before with this, um, you know, uh, the, the, the walk or the Caesar's palace, where it feels like it's outside, but you're actually inside the earth, mm -hmm. and the earth is so um, cavernous that, yeah. that that sort of thing is possible. He doesn't, you know, get, you know, technical on how the light gets in. Mm -hmm. But so he contrasts that with the real surface of the earth. Right, so this is what people talk about Plato's, um, what's called his theory of ideas and things like that. On, but on the surface of the real earth, colors are more intense, more brighter, more pleasing. Everything is up a notch. Maybe it's what people you know, love to call the fourth dimension and, I, and I'm honest with you. I've, generally, I have absolutely no idea what they're talking about when they say that. You know, uh, we're moving to the fourth dimension, but I don't know what that means. Well, it's like this, only, you know, the assholes are gone. You know, I don't know what it's supposed to mean. So you can go back to Socrates to find this kind of description of, of, of the true earth, you know, of the, of, the, of the true earth. And somehow, you know, what you're saying about um, the city of Astana, and it seems like my my experience is not necessarily of that, and you know I've had a, a number more psychedelic experiences than Chris has had. Um, that it's it's semi connected with what's called the imaginal world, mm -hmm. right? Mm -hmm. And this is something a, a term that Henri Corbin came came up with. Um, he's a brilliant scholar from. Well, mostly last century, and this imaginal world, and it's it's talked about in in most spiritual traditions. Um, it's more explicit in the Islamic one, but what it is, 
uh, more in the Sufi traditions. But it's 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 the dream. It could be you call it the Aboriginal dream time, mm -hmm. but it's it's more real, more rich. But it's also has a it's also a physical world in a certain sense, mm -hmm. right? Where things yeah. move, three change. It's also where I where I think the mythic world is, you know. And so it's connected with the eternal much more. So that if you know, so if you're living in in mythic time, you know, it's a different kind of time. It's not a linear time, yeah. And and the the mythos, all these myths that we that we that we know and that embody that we embody actually take take place in 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 this other time. Mm -hmm. um, and and they're always and it's outside of time. It's outside of outside of time, not in time. You know, it's outside of time, and so like they're always recurring. Kairos, that's sacred. Like um, um, Marcia Eliade wrote a book called The Myth of Eternal Recurrence. Mm -hmm. And all these myths are eternally recurring. You know, Isis is always remembering um, Osiris, things like that. Um, so I think that a place like Astana, uh, this other place that we looked at, it's the capital of uh, Turkmenistan called Ashka. Ashkabat or something? Yeah. Ashkabat. Ash we'll, Ash we'll, we'll show some pictures here in a few minutes, guys. Yeah. So I think these places are connected, and this is going back to what you said earlier, to this sort of imaginal overlay. Mm -hmm. So what they're doing in tapping in to a certain extent is some of this imaginal realm when they're building these cities, when they're formatting these cities, you know, when we talked about the numbers, the sacred geometry mm -hmm. numbers that were tied into them. So why you feel good to a certain extent when you see them is because they're tapping into these things. Now, for what ultimate reason, you know, we can only guess at. Um, yeah, to make I mean, it attractive, you know. So anyway, you were saying something. Well, I was thinking of I don't know why the the Altai Mountains popped into my head because it seems like um, there was a series of books by Olga Karatidi and um, she talked about she was living in Siberia, a Russian woman. She worked in a psych hospital, and um, she fell into a group of people who were tapped into the ancient spiritual traditions from the Altai Mountains mm -hmm. in that area, not far from Mongolia, yeah, yeah. I guess. Where the word shaman comes from. Yeah. And so it seems to me that that part of the world is like a container for the ancient wisdom. Mm -hmm. And so it's almost like still hanging in the air. It would yeah. be like if it breathed out, if it exhaled mm -hmm. in its time, that that, that exhalation is still extant it's, oh, it's still totally. like when you go to you, you know what like you know long after she's been there she you know or whatever you can still smell your grandmother's perfume in the room yeah. she's in. like it's, that or like perfume you know, is a perfect perfect there, yeah scent. i think i even heard there's like a term called the like i'm saying is the perfume of memory right kind yeah. of thing that it's something stays lingers in the air like you know when you go to your great grandparents house it's like shit that you know what i mean like no one's been there for five years and you're going to clean it out it still totally smells like them when you were there and you know so i think that perfume still lingers in that part of the world and it's infused mm -hmm. in the culture mm -hmm. so maybe that's what you're seeing that that's just their whole expression and and way of being in the world which in sanskrit would be bhava so it's the way Becoming. comes from the root B-H-U, which means to become. So it's how you become, you're constantly becoming in the world, right? So the bhava of place there still holds the resonance of that sacred knowledge. So I want to, I feel like, so I want to address Asana first, and then I think the other place in Turkmenistan, and then the, you sent me an article that was interesting about the Soviet Union as well, and you sent me some different kinds of pictures. I feel like I want to address Astana separately because uh, the thing in Astana feels, so what you're saying may very well be true, right? That may linger in the air there, right? And so it feels to me like that has been, in the case of Astana, captured in a way, right, that is now recreated like that essence that maybe somebody who went there and just sort of meditated or psychedelicized their way into the sort of spiritual realm there would tap into that. Like I often have something like that. If I'm having an experience when I'm on a, 
you know, Native American land, the tones will be sort of different than when I have it in a mm -hmm. warehouse in downtown Los Angeles or something, mm -hmm. right? But that, that sort of, there'll be similarities in the experience, but there'll be some differences in terms of texture and tone based on what you're talking about, right? But there seems to me with what they've done with Astana to be something very synthetic kind of overlay of it. It doesn't feel organic to me in any kind of way. Or plastic. It feels very much like, yeah, like it's been 3D printed, mm -hmm. right? Like it's been 3D printed into existence. And like one of the things that I'm sort of sensing, because I've been eyeing it a little bit when we, first, when we started talking about it, and we'll get into a little bit maybe some of the things I looked into about light, color, and spectrum and, and things like that. Um, but it feels to me, so they, um, it's a highly, techn highly technological society, it seems like. Um, and it's, it's uh, like, I have a, like a sense that like, there may be a lot of uh, cryptocurrency kinds of operations going on there. I don't have any mm -hmm. evidence of that. This is just my no, no. intuition. It stands to reason but I could see that that might be like maybe the first city or the first country to move strictly to digital coin. Um, I could see that that could be a possibility there. Safe bet. Um, and it's incredibly inexpensive to live in a very high end, very modern apartment there, right? So I went and looked just out of curiosity, like how much apartments cost there, right? <clears throat> And for like five or 600 US dollars a month, you can get like a very modern apartment with marble floors, with granite countertops and all that kind of stuff. It's fairly large. It's really close in the city where all the restaurants and nightclubs are. And mm -hmm. by the way, there is a big nightclub, you know, there's like a lot of nightclub activity, clubs that are open all night with dance music and stuff like that. You know, mm -hmm. which you don't think of as being part of a totalitarian environment, but let me assure you, on a certain, a certain sense, it is, right? Um, so you could live very well there for five or six hundred dollars a month, mm. but everything there is entirely smart. All those apartments are completely smart apartments. Everything is completely wired in, controlled by the internet. There's no like that. That's the deal. Like every ad I looked at said talked about you know, the astonishing, you know, control you can have from your cell phone, this, that, the other thing, blah, 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 right? And so I could see, you know, one of the things that a lot of people get into, a lot of people of a spiritual nature, in fact, right, get into at a certain point is they're like, they're tired of the rat race in the United States or in Europe or whatever, right? Mm -hmm. And they would like to go live in one of these like third world or more de 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 developing countries as long as it has like the cost of living there is low and it has good internet so they can do their work, right? Mm -hmm. And so Austin meets that. And on top of it, there's this draw for certain kinds of people that for as misguided or mind controlled as this might be, are sort of looking to go home. They're looking for an environment that feels harmonious to them, where they can be around people that are like-minded, that are sort of spiritual in nature, but have, you know, uh, um, a level of technology infused in that because they're not Luddites, right? Like I see this a lot in people from like the Burning Man community, from like the yoga, dance music community in here in Los Angeles, the vegan community, the dip, right? Like there's sort of this fusing of, mm -hmm. of all of these things. And these are also people who are really drawn to a lot of these modern healing modality, modalities that have mm -hmm. to do with light and sound and color and you'd say that even their music and their entertainment is a form of that, right? Like a lot of people are going to events where there's like a wild party, but before the party starts or after it's over, there's a, you know, a sound bath, right? Or a chakra healing sound gong meditation or something like that, right? Mm -hmm. So people are very will willing to have their um, therapy fused with other things, fused with their culture, fused with their entertainment, fused into their living space. It's nice to have it fused into your living space, right? But, um, you know, so I see Asana as being like, almost like a Lego version of that, right? Like it's mm -hmm. like, like a Lego land for sort of metaphysical, you know, like a metaphysical form of transhumanism kind of thing, right? Like where, I don't know, like, I don't know if I'm doing a good job describing it. Well, I think you are. And okay. I think AI is a huge part of it. Mm -hmm. it would have to be, wouldn't it? Yeah. Yeah. Um, well, yeah, and further, I mean, I understand the feeling because probably at this point, 
um, if, if, you know, uh, we have like a hard connection to Turkey. And to be honest with you, when we were last there in 2015, I, I was feeling that, yeah, I'm just like, this is home. And I, I get to be here every 30 years, but you know, and I'm, and you know, I'm just doing time here. But what you, you just know? said, what you just said, I know people who say that about Burning Man. They say Burning Man is their home. They only get to be there one week a year and they put up with all the bullshit for the rest of the year so they can go home for one week a year. Mm -hmm. Now, I think Turkey is a little different because I looked, I, I'm, I haven't been to Turkey. I don't know a lot about it. You guys were the second people to send me things on Turkey, and you guys only did because I told you that Joseph, thank you, Joseph C., had sent me some interesting something telling me to check out Turkmenistan, right? Well, no, it's a different. It's not Turkey. It's different. Right. They're different. I get it. it I'm is getting different. confused. Okay. It is different, but that's where the Turks came from. Yes. Okay. So we started looking at some other stuff, too, and not just this. But I'll say about Turkey, every person I've ever known who has, has ever been to Turkey ha feels that way. Like, I think Turkey was one of my favorite places my grandmother had ever been. My dad told me that, like, when we got into a conversation about Turkey. So there's something uh, maybe that scratches at your primordial needs or whatever that, like, gets, or something that reminds you of, you know. Because it's still on a human level, and it's, yeah. And, and the people are the, really, the people are really human. Yeah. As well, yeah. And very good looking. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> it doesn't hurt. Yeah. Beautiful and 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 the food is incredible. It's it's like it feeds all the senses. When you go down to the Egyptian market in Istanbul, down by the Galata Bridge, you can smell the herbs, the spices. The mm -hmm. spice it's called the spice bazaar, the Egyptian spice bazaar. Mm -hmm. You're a couple of miles away, and you're walking down there. Maybe the sea breezes bring the the fragrances in, but it's like a magnet. It's just like you can ride the fragrance into the, well, there's that perfume again, you know? Yeah, I was it's just like, going to say, it makes me it's, think. It's like, activating everything back here, yeah. you know? Well, it makes me almost think, though, like some of those spices and some of those smells and senses, like, I wonder how that connects to some of those sort of visions, because Turkey is also known for uh, interesting patterns, very, a little different oh, yeah. looking than some psychedelic patterns from other places, but they also have all those cathedrals and churches there that have, you know, crazy looking mosaics and titles. And they do. I want to, they I do want the to, Byzantine stuff, yeah. Yeah. I want, yeah. I want to get to that, but let's just, with the Astana thing, I kind of want to go through and just sort of show people a little bit like what I'm, what I looked at in terms of pictures in Astana and then what mm -hmm. I sort of, I did a little bit of a deep dive one day on light spectrum therapy and light spectrum to, to color therapy tuning and all sorts of stuff, right? So I'm going to see, I'm never good at the, I'm better at Robert Phoenix than screen sharing and sharing media, <laughs> but uh, I'm not great at it. Okay. I was watching him fiddle with that this morning. It was fun. Yes, I know. Yeah, but, and Robert has to do it live. Yeah. So yes. Yeah. I never go back and edit the, the stuff, but um, all right, let me go. Okay. So here we go. So first, like when you just look up Astana on like Google, like when you look up the images, um, and this is probably what I did right when I first heard about it mm -hmm. from, from uh, Seven Bomar. And he may have done more work on Astana since back then. I don't follow him regularly anymore because it's too much of a time commitment for too little payoff. Um, but some of his stuff is very interesting. But I saw, and we talked about this before, some of these images we've seen um, in uh, the, the other special, the special we did before with Randy. But there's a little bit of a, like, it's very colorful, right? Like you see it that is. they're playing with yeah. lights and tones and, and angles and it's very, it's got some of the qualities of what yeah. things look like in a psychedelic, you know, trip, right? It's just does. It's just yeah. anybody yeah. Who's, ever, who's ever done it knows that, right. you know, you see some things, um, yeah. you know, you see, you know, some interesting things, and you also see sort of what they're made of, right? When you're yeah. in the psychedelic space, or for some people, even just in the meditative space, right? You can kind of pop into this other world, um, but you see stuff that looks both ornate and decorative, but there also seems to be a technological function to it. Mm -hmm. 
right? Like, it's you know, like, um, it's like a circuit board. Yeah. Mm -hmm. It looks like a circuit board with beautiful colors on it and things that are moving. Something's alive, right? Like this looks, you know, what else looks always like that to me that always is so interesting. And people think I'm funny when I say this, but, um, when I'm at parties and I go and I look at like the, all the equipment up on the DJ's table, cause they have turntables and several different kinds of mm. boxes and synthesizers. And when the room is dark and there's lights on these things, some of them light up really interesting different colors. It looks just almost exactly like this. You know what I mean? Here's an interesting yeah. picture here that kind of look at wow. that, the way that whole, wow. you know, street lines up. But these, you know, I can't sit, see this is you know there's some stuff here that's like oh okay this is some of the futuristic worlds i've seen both in my imagination and in my psychedelic visions and also in the media that i've been presented since i was young about what futuristic or imaginary worlds where special little children can be whisked off to once all the baddies are gone or once once they've separated from the you know the monster that's chasing them and you know even that movie that we've talked about a couple of times with Robert Midnight Special, when the kid finally is going to the futuristic world that exists sort of right above ours, it does have this sort of spherical, technological sort of look to it, right? So I looked at this and then tell me if this, I hope I don't have to come out to change. If I change screens, do you guys see the change of screen? Yeah. Did it change? Okay, good. So then this was, you know, here's a few more. This thing here actually looks a lot like um, sometimes what you see the Burning Man, right? Like from, you know, the structure right. that they, right. they burn right. every and year. And, right. and we just discussed that as being, um, you know, the, the the main mythology behind the Kazakh people is is the bird laying this this uh, this golden egg in in, yep. in this tree, and um, and then there's a snake underneath it that comes up, and the hero. Uh, kills the snake and the bird carries him off. There's it goes all the way back to Gilgamesh, the this particular story. Yeah. So um, here, those are some similar pictures already that I showed. Let's see. I was I was going to add, you know, those yeah. that that purple, that golden yellow, and that blue. Um, you know, certainly those are colors that I experienced during the one time I I did um, ayahuasca. Mm -hmm. You know, those those colors are, uh, you know, definitely part of that particular experience. I've never heard anybody talk extensively about the color spectrum of the ayahuasca experience. That's an experience I haven't had. I have heard people talk about the colors involved in the DMT experience and, of course, in the mushroom experience, you know. So this is sort of the same structure during the day, right? And then it, at night, it's this. Wow. Right. And it also reminds me of like when you see pictures from China mm -hmm. at their festivals. So if yep. they have a, they have an ice festival where all they have these stunning carvings out of ice. It's like a whole city carved mm -hmm. out of ice. And then at night they illuminate it with all these sort of neon to me, to my eye, it's garish coloring. Um, Remember that from the Olympics, there was that where they had like the gymnastics and everything. I think they called it the bird nest and it sort of lit up like that at night with the different colors. It looked like a bird's nest made of like little white twigs and stuff that had that sort of look you're talking about. Mm -hmm. Right. And at night it would have different colors. Look at this architecture here. Yeah. Boy. So that's, yeah, that one is designed wow. on a golden mean spiral. And yeah. It's, it's, but it's done in a very, you know, very trippy way. Wow, yeah. Look at this. It's, yeah. Yeah, that's I think uh, not built yet. It's Talk not about built. A vortex. But this and is. Look at the undulation oh, at says, the base. Oh, that says Taipei. Mm -hmm. Sorry. Oh, that's Taipei. Right? But I mean, look at. Oh, that one was Taipei. Yeah. Okay, so this one's back on what we're at. But the, I mean, this is this is what they're sort of going for. Well, that looks like a double helix. Yeah, but this at is least it's helix. imaginative. You know, it activates the imagination. Look at this. Well. Huh. Right. So, you know, so Chris and I went to the, uh, not together, but we went to the New York World's Fair, 64, 1964, 1965, mm -hmm. um, which feels like a fair amount of time ago at this point. But, you know, all these imaginations were there. You know, mm -hmm. there was the city of the future. There was, you sat in this Ford galaxy, of course, and uh, drove through the Ford exhibit and, and there would be you know, these buildings of the future and they don't, and the spheres were right. always prominent and, and, and curves. And you could see that that was the architecture that was coming around then, you know, the, uh, 
the the Wings of Man, the uh, the famous TWA airport in yep. JFK, was one of the first of those. You know, to get this sort of I guess at some point the um, the technology was there to to with with strength of materials to make these kind of buildings. Where that was the promise of the sixties. Yeah, it's like sort of the symbology of the ascension of man into heaven. Right, the man can mm -hmm. become God, or or right, like that sort of rise, that you know, kind of thing. Yeah. So when I looked at this and went back and looked at these things before we were preparing for that last show with Randy, I was like, okay, so what is going on with lights and colors there, right? And, and obviously we talked about what's going on with the geometry. We've already given a full show on that. But I started looking up and I did this also as I was, mm, I can't remember if it was before or after I talked with um, Joseph, Jacob Lieberman, right? Who also does the lights, but light spectrum therapy and color therapy and stuff. So I have a couple of articles that I looked at and I sent them on to you, but I, I, I'm in a different space than I was three months ago. So I didn't necessarily pick up the same things when I went back and looked at them. But one of the things that I started looking at was this, I, I, you know, I have this article here. I'll, I'll link to all these articles that I looked at in the show notes. But it's talking about adjusting people's psychology or moods through light. That's, mm -hmm. And that's as old as the hills. As old as the hills, right? But they're talking about like sitting in front of light therapy color boxes can be as effective as, as Prozac, right? Mm -hmm. and we kind of know that like this thing that has happened, this lobotomizing of humanity that happened under the guise of being an antidepressant kind of thing or to right. help people with their depression is been part of what's gotten people to this mind-controlled idiot space that we're in right now. Right. Mm -hmm. And so they're talking about like having this light box and, you know, this is also good for, um, I can't remember if this was the article or not, but like, you know, these light boxes to, you know, through color and light change people's mood. Now there's a very therapeutic use for that. So I'm not knocking that. Right. But I'm seeing some of this same stuff, right. Extensive use of blue light at night and, and you know, whatnot, other kinds of things as being present in the makeup of many modern cities right now, but for sure there. And this article even talks about something called a dawn simulator, right? Uh, the da a dawn simulator. And, oh, what did I just do? Did I lose my, okay. No, I lost my, I just went totally out of, okay. A dawn simulator here. Where did it go? Okay. And this dawn simulator can make it so that like a person doesn't, it's, you know, like you could convince somebody it's a different time of day, right? Then, then it actually is. And this goes to what I was saying about like being in those places where you feel like the outside inside right. kind of thing, right? Mm -hmm. um, environment. Yeah. Like a controlled environment and that, you know, there's a, and remember, these pl these places are all with apartments that are smart, right? And so the same thing could be happening in terms of like the lighting that's in these places. It's almost like, you know, a controlled or um, programmed wellness of the society, right? Like keep people sort of, you know, technologically. Okay, because uh, in my mind, I'm wondering, well, what's the what's the telios? What's the end point? What where are they going with that? That's a lot of trouble to go to. So is that what it's all about then to have these um, artificial cities and artificial environments to keep people contained? Con people contained, con people content, and also mm -hmm. keep people functioning at a certain level because we've all been made aware of the fact that there's a patent out there to use people's bodies, fluids, and energy production as a mining cap capability for cryptocurrency, right? And yeah. for, you know, for, for generation of enough power for running other kinds of things, right? Okay. So if you can kind of keep people on a certain clock, right? Or, or even a false clock. Like let's say you want the you know, person to be sleeping, but some aspect of their endocrine system thinks it's day. So even though they're asleep, because and, and I have had my own experience with this kind of stuff, there's an agitation going on of their nervous system or their endocrine system so that they're actually producing you know, hormones that are stimulative that create this kind of energy that's being talked about. Interesting. In terms of and that in that energy. Yeah, and um, uh, even going back to, um, you know, sadly when Chris's mom had Alzheimer's, 
she did not know whether it was day or night. Right. I mean, she'd be, she'd be just talking about it being night at this time of day with yeah. the sun out and all this sort of stuff. Mm -hmm. It was really, it was really, you know, an astonishing thing to experience right. the when, when she went like that. It was right. very sad, but. Well, the whole thing, know. the whole thing was bad. Yeah. Um, so yeah, so then for the harvesting of that person's well, energy. That, and, in this, and in this case, and again, this is just me playing with things in my own mind. And we well, should. Well, we, we don't should. Know. We don't know. I mean, this is a good yeah. thing. But it could even also just be an experiment in terms of like, well, the world is a, you know, a difficult and painful place and people are unhappy. Is it possible to create an environment where people have the sense of well-being? right? Like, you know, the path to hell is paved with good intentions. I'm not saying they have good intentions, right? But like, okay, you know, like there's probably, you know, like, you know, they do lots of experiments on lots of things for lots of reasons, right? And, this and we know. Experiments are getting bigger and broader and, and, and whatever, whatnot, right? We already have heard about, you know, Robert likes to talk about how they have plans to turn, you know, the United States into just a collection of megalopolises, right? And that they mm -hmm. may be contained in a dome that might not actually be a physical dome, but like an energetic one. And there's like, you know, the technology only works sort of inside of there. And if you go outside of that, you're sort of not involved in that. And that sets up this possibility of creating, you know, a controlled environment. When you go into a, a spa or a museum or a restaurant, they want to create a certain setting, a certain aesthetic, a tone, a feel, a vibe, right? Like, what, why, why, why would it be out of the realm of possibility to think that there's going to be entire cities or countries that eventually start doing this, that it create this sort of, you know, synthetic experience that can be changed and tuned and mutated over time? Right. Yeah. Well, my, my, I guess where I'm, where I'm thinking with this, um, you go back to Brave New World and the way Soma is discussed in Brave New World, right? Mm -hmm. Soma is a palliative. It's, uh, you know, it's an antidepressant for everybody. <clears throat> Whereas Soma originally, right, in the Vedic um, sacrifice, in the, in, the, in the Vedic tradition, was, um, well, basically it was used to, to make you feel, understand what's real, right? To, to mm -hmm. get to have the full experience of, of what is real, let's put it mm -hmm. that way. Um, whereas now everything is geared, like I said, everything is turned into its opposite. So the soma now, whether it's antidepressants or even so if we extend it to, you know, uh, colored environments to prevent everyone, uh, everyone is getting farther away from their lived experience, right? From, mm -hmm. from the direct experience, which is painful, which is pleasurable, which is all those friggin' things. And you know, talk about wanting to move because at the moment, you know, my experience of living of living in anywhere in this country is painful, but it's not going to be any different anyplace else. But you know, right now, you know, it, it's painful for me to go out and 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 trip out and everybody's with their masks on. So so there's so there's another of the inversions, and and I even noticed that. So and and so not only is the you know the people taking antidepressants, which are you know apparently, I don't know like half the population right, at least, it sounds right? That way. right and the kids as we know are, are online for their medications at schools mm -hmm. um and, but then it extends to this the so-called cool people who are microdosing mm -hmm. and to me the experience of people because i've never really done it is 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 kind of the same oh you know um you know it's described to me as having a really good day which is great have you know having a really good day something like that but you know, uh, it flatlines. If and, you know, I think you know, especially in the tech community, uh, where it's where it's very prevalent. But there's also other people who are who are basically are surprised. But you know, that's their, their choice. Um, so as far as the tech, like, as, okay, a couple of things, a couple of things there. So as far as the microdosing, because I have experimented with it, I haven't done it extensively, um, but. I would say that I, I can't speak to how it's used for people in the tech industry because I think that their minds have been altered, even if it's not, even if they haven't been part of a program or had a chip implanted. I think the level of symbiosis that you develop with the technology that you're, it's like it becomes part, you become part of it or it becomes part of mm -hmm. you. So sure. I, I can't speak, there is like obviously like 
we don't even know what the fuck we're in. We might be in some kind of simulation where this whole thing is technology and we're just seeing these newer forms of less beautiful, more mechanized technology than, than what we had previously, right? Like I've talked about this in terms of like trees and some of the things in nature, but also mushrooms because there is no doubt that when, or, and even ayahuasca, but I can't speak to it because I haven't taken it. When you do mushrooms there and you go to wherever it is you go, there is beauty and art there. Like we're going to get to some of the, the th pictures you sent mm -hmm. me Steve, because it resonates for something that's been going on for me. There, there's no, you know, uh, Astana is like a very beginner kind of trip. Those colors and, and the things that we're seeing, like that's the kind of stuff I saw in the beginning of my psychedelic experiences. And as I've gone deeper and deeper into them, it gets more ornate and more complex and more full of information and, and whatnot. But there's no doubt that when you look very closely at the beautiful designs and things you see on the mushroom experience, when you look at them really closely, you can see that they're machines, they're technology, like they're doing something, they're carrying, like, they, like so their complaint to me on the last psychedelic trip was that people, like there's so much attention paid to this new technology that is not that amazing in the things that it does. And it's also not beautiful. Some of this old, more ancient technology does all sorts of interesting things and it's beautiful and it's reproductive and all that kind of stuff, right? What were you gonna say, Chris? What are machines? You said you can see that they're machines. Right. What, so what's like, the machine? So like the last one, like I've had, I've had this before, but it was very clear on the last one. Like I will look at something that looks like some kind of plant, right? Like this is behind my eyes, like what I'm seeing, right? Some kind of plant but I've seen plants like this in nature. You can sometimes sort of zoom in really close on like the inside of a flower and you'll see that there's all this really ornate kind of stuff, but they're actually like moving and doing stuff, right? It's like an oxygen generating machine. So oh. it's technology that's more organic in nature than let's say like the air conditioner, right? But it like there's, there's a, a there's a predictability there's something that it's doing that is very remindful of things that we now think of as like computers or technology does it it's just done in a way that blends in with everything that is beautiful that incorporates its surroundings and stuff like that into what it's doing right but is that because um technology imitates nature so the plant is a little you know chemical factory that's yep. that's pumping away you know using the sun and making photosynthesizing and making chlorophyll blah 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 so, so is that is that why you can see it reflect is it a reflection of the natural world the technology well, I would say yes and if we're really talking about a conversation of being outside of time i think it's possible that there's a symbiotic that it's both right, that the nature begins to reflect the technology, right, on a certain level, I don't, I don't know, but it's like, you know, like, I, and I've had, I, I've even had this before, at like, parties, like, I'll be, like, if I'm someplace, and the music is great, and the lighting is just right in the place, and I'm having a psychedelic experience, I will look at the speaker, right, and there's this vibration coming out of the speaker, and there's, light. it's like, there's this one sound system called the function one sound system, that really creates a very transcendent kind of experience, but the inside of the speaker like sometimes they're white and sometimes they're black, but it's got like a particular geometry on it. But when you look at it, okay, it's a speaker. It's got, you know, it's got some design on the inside. But when I look at it sometimes, like if I'm in the height of a trip, I can see the kind of carvings there that are like what you see like in Peru or in Mexico or in Turkey, right? Some of this stuff. So something is happening with the vibration, the sound, right? And, and whatever's going on in my mind with the psychedelic, my brain with the psychedelics that come from the mushroom that is creating something that looks exactly like these megaliths or this the carvings that are on the megalith and now like is it creating it or is it allowing you to see what's already there that maybe that right like it's doing what either it's one. a revelation maybe it's more of a revelation than a creation yeah it's, a, it's or it could be both yes so concomitant i can't remember how we got to this this place, um, I think I was just saying, there's no doubt when you take mushrooms, like there's a, you know, technology, there's something there that like is, that is, right. that you feel like it feels like some sort of ancient futuristic technology. You don't know if it's like super old or super far in the future. It's hard to tell. 
because it looks both ancient and you know futuristic at the same time and there's often these really bright colors right which kind of rolls you back into the light spectrum and then because of those articles that you sent us and we were looking at them and at least trying to get a grip on what they were talking about with the splitting of the light with the prism mm -hmm. through a prism mm -hmm. um, exposing the geometries mm -hmm. and and light being vibration Mm -hmm. And color being a vibration of light, and then all those spectrums can be identified through the use of the prism. So we got this wild idea that our friends, Andrew and Chiwa, when we were over their house at Christmas time, they said, hey, you want to see something really cool? We have these glasses that let you look at the lights on your Christmas tree, and it splits the lights mm -hmm. so you can see the geometries mm -hmm. so i was thinking huh well wouldn't that be interesting to be i wonder if we could borrow those those glasses that they had they're just cardboard glasses with a color lens and put it over the lens of the computer camera so we did all right so well we got I the glasses I, so we put up <laughs> it's, but like, it's for pinpoint lights <laughs> You can only do it with certain lights. So this is, just so people know, I'm going to show them, like I sent the Krimi several articles, but I think this is the one they're referring like the to. The one with um, yeah. lights, yeah. So my right. cult, but I think it was the UG LED, or was that it? Mm -hmm. um, there, there's a couple, so I sent them this, right? This is light spectrum glasses looking beyond white light. Right. Kind of break stuff up. So th like this conversation is sort of different than what we may have had three months ago. So I'm going to include all these things I looked at, even though we didn't necessarily talk about all of these things. But there was this article that, that I showed them. And then there was also this about that one. That's spectrum, the one I'm thinking of. Yeah. Right. And my thought was with some of the interesting architecture, right, in, in Austin, right? And let's say that there's a controlled environment on a certain level, like an, a certain sort of you know, these structures have lights within them and then there's maybe some kind of ambient control. There's actually like a spectrum that's being tuned there that is unique to exactly. that. Exactly. Yeah, just stay on that one second. Um, okay. Right, so when I read the explanation for this particular graph, they were talking about these very, of course, the more you narrow the band, the more intense the light, the color is, right? Mm -hmm. That's obvious. Uh, and they were talking about blue being the restful and red being the active, and that made mm -hmm. sense. But then they were also mentioning this white line as being significant. And they're calling that CRI lighting, which means color rendering index. Yep. <laughs> and then that, that kind of um, affects the appearance of the color. So it would be like emulating the sun, really. Mm -hmm. So that when you are indoors, you can replicate the actual um, perception of color yep. to be, <laughs> excuse me, approximate to what you would be in, in daylight. Right. The, like this picture down here, like shows some, like you see that there's tones here that are rep, like, we're mindful of like what the day looks like when it's sunny, when you're at night with the moon. Like this article, and or it was either this article or one that was attached to it, even talked about having particular combinations of light that creates like a patented or a designer tone that only you can have in your space, right? That like, it, it's, you know, it, it, it's unique to that space. It's an interesting thing. I'll link to all of this. Go ahead. Oh, did we lose Chris? Yeah. Well, Chris just got a little tickle in her throat, but uh, so for the, uh, anyway, if you want, if you switch back to us for a second. Yeah. And now if you look at the lights behind us, mm -hmm. they should, instead of being lights they should be six pointed yeah i know it might be hard to see from that far back, no i can see it now it's like it's yeah it looks like little need, snowflakes or yeah yeah exactly so you need like pinpoints of light it won't work with a large light but we we found um actually yeah so we found uh, some some lights and uh, they actually still work um because what we're discovering now is that lights that we buy for christmas only last about a month before they bust up. So that's but. really in interesting because oftentimes when you're in the psychedelic space, and I've had this occur for me also in like a meditative or vision, just trance space, not with any psychedelics, you see geometry superimposed on everything, 
right? Like, like everything looks much more colorful and you can sort of see the geometric right. makeup sort of either imposed or underlying everything. So right. And, yeah. And, and, and let's say, so the advantage of say mush mushrooms over say LSD, mm -hmm. <clears throat> which seems much more mind, um, you know, interactive. Whereas the, the Have mushroom, you done LSD? Oh yeah. Uh, mess, a uh, mess. O times when I was in college. So my, like I did, I did acid before I ever did mushrooms. And then once I started doing, did, doing mushrooms, I never did acid again. My experience with acid is what you're saying. It's much more mental. It's much more like psychological, yeah. analytical, but I never, like, I didn't discover the sort of closing my eyes and looking at the visions and the geometry until much later. And uh -huh. so I don't know, had I done the same thing on acid, what I would have seen, I never did it. I never went look, you know, but like, and I didn't in the beginning with the mushrooms either. That came along later. I think one day I just closed my eyes and I noticed that there was interesting stuff back there. And then that became the mm -hmm. focus of my psychedelic trips after that. Is Chris well, okay? My, yeah, she's, I mean, she's got a little, a little tickle in her throat that she needs to. Do you want me to hit pause? Um, I think, I think we can just muddle along since she, she's, she's never done any, uh, she's done DMT once, <laughs> and ayahuasca once. Um, but the, the, um, the thing that I've always experienced with mushrooms was, was it was very somatic. It was very much, it was much, very much a body, full body feel. Mm -hmm. And and that and what you know the thing that attracted me most was that feeling of unity, the mm -hmm. feeling of, of of oneness of wholeness. Yep. You know that you don't get otherwise. Um, with LSD, it was it it was tended to be very different. You could have that, but it was just uh, you know just a very different kind of thing. Um, the LSD to me was more like observing yourself and then observing yourself, observing yourself, right? Yeah, Whereas um, the the mushrooms are a much softer, more Everybody's yeah. part of it, kind of thing. Yeah, and coming down, fun. and coming, yeah, coming down off of acid always sucked. Um, and I probably, kind of like <laughs> and I didn't, <laughs> and I didn't. Oh well, you know, I, I, you know, the thing is though, the stuff that when I started taking it, it wasn't in the Owsley days, so it was much more, and there, there must have been some much more of a synthetic and uh, other kind of thing going on. They probably threw a lot of speed in at the time, um, you know. Whereas mushrooms, mushrooms, they turn off. Yeah. yeah. When they're done, it's like a switch goes off. Okay, we're done. Right. It's a nice you know? soft landing. It's a nice yeah. soft landing. You have something to eat. You chat about it a little bit. You go to bed and in the morning you kind of, huh, that was really fascinating, <laughs> you know? Yeah. Yeah. It's been a while. Last time I did it was on my, I think, 22nd birthday. So it's been a while for me, but it was still, I always enjoyed that much more, you know, than the, uh, the other my venues. Favorite. Yeah. Um, you know, and maybe the worst was, uh, not worse, but um, salvia divinorum is, is a whole other. I've heard that. I've never done that. I've heard that. <laughs> well. Yeah. Yeah, I wouldn't recommend that. That's just like a different, different, different world you end up to. <laughs> but I think what happens is, and I guess, well, especially with the ayahuasca ex experience, it's a different. Ayahuasca puts you into a different kind of mythology, and maybe because it comes from a particular jungle, and there's, there's some sort of traces of that. Um, mushrooms are much more universal. They're yep. everywhere. The psychedelic mushrooms are used by shamans in, in, in every culture. Um, you know, that peyote buttons, things like that. Um, so, but the, but so, so it, it accesses, but again, back to the color, but it does access these, these higher level colors, these, mm -hmm. you know, these, these colors that you can, uh, mm -hmm. from lack of going back to what I said before, the imaginal realm mm -hmm. these sort of these colors that exist you know sort of um just a little outside of our spectral reach mm -hmm. um, so i don't know where i'm gonna go with that but that's just it could, kind of i mean that goes to what so i think the thing with astonic because i think what we'll do because as always this conversation went a little different than i had imagined in just a second we'll take a break and we'll move over to the other segment and then we'll get into a little bit more uh some of the stuff about turkmenistan and something you showed me about the other so the the, what's going on in Russia, and then we'll just go wherever we go. Um, but it feels to me like one of the things that this project in Astana has done is captured some of the texture and tones of the psychedelic experience mm -hmm. or the meditative experience. Because I, I've talked to people who like it's it's a match, and I, I've had some I've had little bits of that 
with my own just like vision stuff and whatever. Like, I'm not a big meditator or yoga person, but I have had enough experience. Well, yeah, I cross over into a little bit of that. It's never quite as expressed or explicit as it is in the mushroom state, but it feels like it's sort of captured some of the texture and tone of that and then sort of projected it or superimposed it onto like something that's like a combination of like Disneyland and Legoland. Mm -hmm. Right, like they have all this fabulous sort of geometry, and it's you know these structures are nice, they're glass, they're geometric, but there's not some of that like really interesting, ornate, complicated kind of design that you see in some more of the old world stuff. That when you take a really good close look at that, that actually has a really futuristic you know aspect to it as well, but it's very different than just what we see in Astana, right? Yeah. Like Astana, everything looks like it's you know a piece of equipment on a certain level yeah yeah when you look at the old really ancient architecture it, it you, your body goes into resonance with it mm -hmm. it's meant to elevate the human spirit mm -hmm. and this does feel more like it's for spectacle for spectacle and not for so like i've talked about at conspiracy cocktail how i feel like mid-century modern architecture is like a blank slate for you to sort of dump the uh, contents of your own mind onto and to look at with the color spectrum that they, you know, it's very white with certain kinds of bright colors, but there's these angles. And if you're in that sort of more loose mind space, you can sort of use that as a place to project the contents of your mind on. This sort of angles and thing in Astana is different. It doesn't seem like something for you to project your own thoughts. It seems like something where it's projected on it for you to pick up off of, right? right. For yep. you to pick yep. up on. Yeah, and yeah, because yeah. one of the things that, uh, Keith Critchlow talked about, who was an architect, do sacred geometry. We talked about him a few times, you know, and he said, look at, you know, modern the architecture. What's that? The ice uh -huh. cream truck is here. <laughs> the ice cream truck. Oh, oh. So modern architecture. Not a distraction, is it, Emily? <laughs> there, there are no human scale elements in modern architecture. It's a big glass slab, you know, look at the things that are swirling like this. They're all you know, they, they don't resonate with parts of our body. In other words, if you look at the ancient cathedrals, there's things the size of your hand. There's things the size of your body. Your body goes in resonance with that type of architecture as opposed to, like you said, the other thing is just mind. It's, 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 so it's pulling out of our body. And we talk, and when Chris and I talk about the body, we're not talking, we're talking about the body in terms of, of yoga, which is the body through which all experience uh, is, is is experience the body so, of experience it's the body of experience it's not a body in space bouncing around the body is space the body contains totally, space, yeah. right you know it's the the, the the truth is inside you inside you how to dissipate and fall apart why why mushrooms are taken <laughs> for all these millennia right. Because because it's hard and but it but that experience does not have to be through mushrooms. It can be doesn't done have to be through and practice. For a lot of people, I don't recommend it. Yeah, for it's yeah, not for, for everybody. Yeah, for me, the most intense and out there experiences have been you know non drug involved at all, except maybe a little coffee. But um, you know <laughs> that can be a powerful psychedelic as well. <laughs> well, there was yeah. Well, there's you know there's and that came out and of course that came out of the Middle East. Yep. You know, right. the coffee out of, uh, well, I guess Ethiopia originally. Um, okay, so let's do this. Let's finish up here. We're going to go over in the second part. I want to talk a little bit about Turkmenistan, Turkey, some of the images that you sent to me in relationship to the enlightened, the guy, the, the guy who talked, who was killed for his enlightenment, basically. Yeah, Suhuwadi. Suhuwadi. Yeah. I want to talk about some of that stuff. Um, but before we go, um, where can people find you? This is the end of the public hour. Let them know where they can find you. Logosophiabooks.com. L-O-G-O-S-O-P-H-I-A-B-O-O-K-S.com. Logosophiabooks.com. Yeah, there's a podcast page on our site where we, we have all our conversations with you. And um, we have monthly conversations with Robert Phoenix on the Friday Farcast. Um, so there's a whole and mess some of really things. old videos. Are they up there? The really old videos from when we did classes and no, those that's on our Vimeo oh, page. This Vimeo. logo Sophia has a Vimeo page. It has it has a you know these are not things that we promote anyway, but um, and uh, and I have been writing some blog posts. I'm working on another one now, 
Um, each one I lose a friend, so that's good. So a few more, few more I'll be alone. Maybe I'll pick make somebody someone. really, if you don't make somebody really angry at you, it wasn't worth doing, right? So, yeah. All right, cool. So that's where you guys can find them. And I just want to remind everybody, if you're watching this on the Off Planet Media YouTube channel, please also go over and subscribe to the Emily Moyer YouTube channel. Yep. A lot of my content still appears here. Everything I do appears there and all the content appears there before it appears on the Off Planet Media channel. So please go over there and subscribe. It's acting as a backup, as a backup channel as well. Um, and we will see you on the other side. Stay tuned. Join us at, okay. at, at patreon.com forward slash Off Planet Media for the rest of the show. See you on the other side.